7, Matthew 7, it says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had a, its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So God, right now, we just pray that we build our foundation on you. We build our houses on you. We build our lives on you. We build our homes on you because we know that with you is the safest place to be. So when the streams rise, when the winds blow, when the rain falls, when life begins to beat us down, when life begins to throw its problems at us, we can stand on the firm foundation, which is the solid rock, Jesus Christ. Uh, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you'll continue to do in the miracle signs and wonders that we will see in this service, in this time, in this lifetime. We love you, Lord. We count it all done in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Altars are open if you feel led to come down here and pray, if you feel led to kneel before God. However you want to seek the throne, feel free to do so. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, yes we do, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, oh, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and Every tribe, every nation, all around the room. Let's listen to the worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Yeah. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. God, you're worthy. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You are worthy. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Santo, Santo. Oh. 
darkness, you're the way in the wilderness, you're the river in the desert, and you will make a way for us.
and go back to the beginning because the redeemed of the Lord can say so. And we're going to claim our heritage of being redeemed today. There are some things that we need to get back to. So let's close our eyes and pray. Father God, Abba Father, Lord, we here. We here, oh God, not to hide behind the fig leaf, oh God. We here to be honest with you, God. Lord, we need you in this place. We need you in our hearts. We need you in our life, oh God. God, that said that you're a way maker, oh God. You're a miracle worker, Lord. God, we know that the gospel, the gospel, oh God, is good news, Lord. And Lord, we need to see your miracle working power in our generation, in our time, oh God. That it's not dead, oh God. That it's for us right now, oh God. We say that we are the redeemed of the Lord. We receive your full salvation today, God. So, God, we ask you, oh God, everybody in here, be honest with the Lord. We can't hide from him. So, God, you know our frustrations. You know some of us may be mad at you, oh God. Some of us can't reconcile the stuff that's happening in our lives, Lord. But today, oh God, we're just going to be honest. We're not going to pretend that we're Christian. We're not going to pretend that we're righteous. God, we're just here to be honest. We want to be naked before you, God. No fig leafing today. Lord, we ask that you come and find us. We receive your salvation. Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus to restore, to restore our hearts to a place, Lord, where you're first, where you can be our Lord and we be your people. name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we proclaim and 
our deliverance and our salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Because he had the first word over your life. He's going to have the final word. He has the final say. He has the final say. What your doctor said is not the final say. What your parents said is not the final say. What the people at your job said is not the final say. But his word is the only word that matters. He's the only way out of the darkness. He's the only way out of the darkness. So I cling to you, my God. And I put my trust in you. 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 Can you sing that just one time? I put my trust. Declare it all over the room. I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you. I put my trust. Lift it up. I put my trust. I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you. I put my trust. Yeah, because he's the way maker. He's the way maker. See what I say. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the Everybody needs to hear that this morning. My God. necesidades de nuestras adversidades Jesús tú estás ahí Señor tu mano está sobre nosotros Jesús y por eso te agradecemos por eso te amamos por eso te honramos por eso levantamos hoy nuestras manos a ti Jesús para darte toda nuestra adoración todo el honor sea para ti Jesucristo te amamos y te adoramos por siempre Jesús Amén Can we just clap our hands this morning? I'm so grateful we serve a God who sits high and looks down low. Who's above all the problems and all the situations. We serve a great and glorious God, yeah. He's so strong and so mighty, he is. He's so strong and so mighty, he is. Our God is great, yes, he is. Our God is great, yes, he is. Our God is great, yes, she is. Yeah. And our God is great and glorious. And we put our trust in your name, Jesus. Able to save and deliver us. Yes, he is, yes, he is. We put our hope in your name, Jesus. Come on, listen up. Sing blessing. Blessing and honor. Glory and
There's nothing to fear, you are here with us, right here, right now, and we put, we put our hope in your name, Jesus, see blessing, glory, unto our God, forever and ever, all of Wonderful. You are marvelous. So far, I'm the only one speaking. Praise his yes, name today Lord. in yes, this house yes, because Lord. we believe that he is faithful. We believe that you are good, God. There is none like you. And so we lift our voices. We lift our faces. We lift our hearts to you. Oh, God, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Oh, Lord, we want to dedicate our lives to you today. We've come to you to, to lift you up in song. Lord, the situations going on in our life, the concerns that we carry, we lay them at your altar today as we pick up your praise. And Lord, we have felt your Holy Spirit move on us. Lord, we want to continue this act of worship. And you've given us so many opportunities and expressions to show you our dedication our desire to serve you and to demonstrate to the world that we are your sons and daughters redeemed and transformed by you. Father, we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we have the opportunity to see two of our brothers and sisters in this service saying, I want to take my next step in following Jesus and for me, that's baptism. So I'm gonna invite Bree to come up. While she comes, I'm gonna read you. Oh, sorry, you can be seated. And at home, I hope you're already seated. 
Brielle Jefferson. She writes this in her testimony. Recently, I have felt more of the world than of him. I've become comfortable in my life without the Lord. And I came to realize I don't want to live without him. Years ago, when I dedicated my life to God, I felt called to be baptized, but never committed out of fear. Today, I'm letting go of fear and giving it all to him. Amen. I know this might impede some of your view, but I'm just going to ask some of the ladies who would uh, just stand with Brielle right now and on her behalf, just praying that she just be the woman of God that God wants her to be in this world. I'm going to ask everybody now, would you just lift a hand of blessing towards Brielle as I pray for her. valleys and the mountains. And Lord, we declare that those things that wanted to break her, pull her away, have now become a testimony of your faithfulness in her life. Lord, that she will be one who heals others, brings hope and strength to others. And Lord, on, upon her confession of faith now is our privilege to baptize her in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, this time I'm going to invite Aaron, Aaron Culpepper. He's been a member of our church family online, and because of that, we've invited Wendell and Austin. As he's getting in the water, there was a particular request that Aaron had, and I think it's very important for us to participate in this today. He asked that we would pray that not only as he's being baptized in water, and making that dedication of his life to God, but that he would also be filled with the Holy Spirit, what we call baptized in fire. And so brothers and sisters, if you have that gift of the Holy Spirit, would you pray with us in this moment? Because Aaron, the gift of the Holy Spirit is free for all of us. And so what I invite you to do in this moment is just trust God. And if he moves on your heart, just give him the freedom of your heart. Give him the freedom of your mind. Give him the freedom of your mouth. And if it doesn't happen in this moment, that's okay. It's a relationship. It's a walk with Jesus. But if it does, just like you have overcome fear to step into this water, today we're inviting you to step out of fear and trust the Holy Spirit to speak through you in ways that you can't understand, but you sense the Holy Spirit leading. So we're going to pray in just a moment. Here is his testimony. I'm here today because I believe baptism is my next step in obedience to God. For as long as I can remember, I've known the name of Jesus. And for so long, I've held back from being baptized. But after hitting a low place, I've decided to seek him, truly seek him. It's like one day someone took the blinders off my eyes, and I am truly seeing Jesus. Everywhere I look, I see him. And now I can't live without Jesus. Let's pray as we baptize him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father God, right now, we just thank you for Aaron, God. Thank you for Aaron, God. Father, I pray that right now, God, just as John the Baptist baptized you, you came up and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came and rested on your shoulders. I pray in the name of Jesus, the same will happen for Aaron today, oh God. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord God, that as, as Aaron 
walks with you, that you'll begin to show purpose, Father God, in his life, oh God. I plead the blood of Jesus over him right now from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, oh God. And I pray, Lord God, that as he walks with you, his relationship with you will grow stronger and stronger, that as he goes under the water, he'll come back up fresh and new and like never before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Aaron, I just want to ask you real quick, um, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And do you, and do you believe he died for your sins? By your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you right now in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Beloved, let's stand up. Let's worship him today. Will we do that? Let's worship him. Hallelujah. God, there is none like you. We thank you. We worship you. We adore you today. Friends, there's so much going on today. Uh, we have another two great baptisms in our next service. What a wonderful privilege that we have as sons and daughters of God to walk with each other. Because truly at Cornerstone, no one should walk alone. And it's not just in the high points. It's not just in those, those moments where everything seems right and is right. And it's in every moment, the highs and the lows, the good and the difficult. But those relationships only take place when you open your life to walk with one another. Because listen, somebody could chase you down every day of your life to be in relationship with you, but that doesn't mean you are. One of the things that, that we have been praying about here at Cornerstone is that we would truly be disciples. One of the great cries of my heart is because I look at the church in America and I continue to see people who have never been discipled so they don't know how to disciple. And every generation of Christians is only as strong as the witness that they have been able to receive from before them. Beloved, our next generation deserves better. They deserve to have followers of Jesus Christ who truly love one another, not just say it on Sunday morning. Who, who don't just say it when things are easy or we're not dealing with struggles and situations in our lives that we don't understand. And too often, as Christians, we feel like we've got to have all the answers. Beloved, I'm sorry, you can sit down. I got to preaching and I didn't even notice. I thought you were just all in agreement, like, yeah, let's go. If you feel like you need to stand up again, you can do that. Except for you online. Get comfortable. Stay on that couch. And so we seek to truly be disciples so that we can truly make disciples. And so over the past year, the elders, Pastor Sean and I, have been working on what we call the discipleship pathway. Because truly, the life of a follower of Jesus is a pilgrimage. It's a journey. I'm going to invite you to take your phones out and go ahead and scan this QR code right now. Over the next few years, we are going to be bringing opportunities for each and every one of the members of our church or, visit of our, or visitors of our church to enter into the discipleship pathway. This semester, we have three opportunities like that. To give you an idea and an understanding, just for a moment, of what the discipleship pathway means to me, is that it's engaging the head and the heart for action. It's because too often we come to it, and we can have all the passion in the world, but with no wisdom, we're a train wreck. Or we have all the action without the drive of the heart and we become lethargic. Or all the wisdom without application becomes pointless. Beloved, we are made to be whole people, made in the image of God to represent him to others and know him fully. And so the discipleship pathway that we have for you for this coming semester 
are three ways that you can grow in your relationship with God and grow in relationship to one another. These are gonna be cohort style. So seriously, if, if 25 people sign up, most of you aren't gonna make it in this semester. And that's okay is we're gonna to continue to offer these because we want real life-on-life -life relationship. And when you get too many people in the room, some of you guys are gonna get uncomfortable or some of you guys are just gonna coast like it's a classroom. This is not a classroom, this is life. And so if you've scanned that QR code, you'll see that we have three opportunities. One's called living love. What does it really mean to love one another? Sometimes I think we get that twisted. And if God is love, what does it mean for me to live that love in my life and the lives of others? Our elder, Pat Hine, is going to be leading that class on Wednesday nights. I say class, but that's not what this is, so please forgive my terminology. The other one is how to read the Bible. How many of you guys have been saved for longer than most of us have been on the planet? Yeah. And how many times have you read the Bible and found something brand new that you never saw before? Okay, so listen, you may have been a saint your entire life, but there are still ways that you can learn. And too often, we read the Bible because we're reading it in the language that we speak and we think we understand it. But we miss the real context of what's going on there. I used this example the other day. I was talking to somebody and I said, Samachol de Fasset. And for everybody in the room that speaks Wolof, that makes perfect sense to you. But if I translate that directly into English, it means my heart is cold. In an American Western context, that's a bad thing. But for people who live on the edge of the desert where things are ridiculously hot, to have a cold heart is a good thing. So many times when we read scripture, we don't understand the true context of what's taking place in that passage, and so we read it wrong. And if we read it wrong, we're gonna apply it wrong. Matt Coffin, one of our elders, is gonna be leading that class you don't want to miss the opportunity to read the Bible, even if you've been reading it for a generation, to read it anew. And for our Latino and Latina brothers and sisters, we have su manera de orar, his way to pray. Too often we don't understand the purpose of prayer. We make it a one-sided conversation, and we miss out on hearing the voice of God. After service, I'm going to invite you guys, come out through these doors. We have a table set up. Just like you've scanned on the QR code and you've signed up for one of those opportunities to be on this discipleship pathway, you can also go old school and use a pen and paper. And I'm going to be out there. You're blessed. Yeah. I'm going to be out there to help answer any questions that you have. The elders that are here in the service are also going to join me out there. Hey, beloved, God loves you such an incredible way. And because of that, he's given us Winston, Maria, and Blondley. So I'm inviting them now to come and lead us in the word of God, because God has a word that he has placed on their hearts, not just for them, not just for me, but for you. Let's welcome them today. <laughs> Jews on the other side, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, we're good now. Good morning again. Good morning to our community online. Um, I'm very excited to be here this morning. I'm very excited to be here this morning because I get to bring God's message with my family. And that is a gift from God. Only Him can do something like this. Amen? We are going to be today concluding this um, series that we've been 
having new beginnings. And we are going to be reading from Acts 9, verse 36 to 41. Um, our, uh, my beautiful daughter, Blondley, is going to be reading that passage. And my amazing husband, Winston, is going to be praying first. <laughs> okay, let's so, pray. Uh, before we pray, I would like everyone, if you wouldn't mind, t turn to the person next to you and say, God is good. And that, this is for our online viewer also. If you by yourself, you can tell that to yourself, which is good. That's fine. <laughs> so it is good to know that God is good. But it's better to believe that he is good. So let's believe that today as we pray. Heavenly Father, we give you honor and grace. All this here, Jesus, is for you. All this is about you. Let us glorify your name today. Let us feel your love today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bear with me as I read because I have not been in English class for a minute. Okay. <laughs> now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, the disciples hearing that Peter was there sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. Since Lydda was near Joppa, oh, sorry. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Amen. I'm going to ask us to do something. Can we all at the count of three, and online you can join us, thank God for this amazing passage, for this miracle that he performed, and for all the miracles that he's going to perform in us and through us today. Can we do that? Yeah. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you know what just happened here? We just exercise faith. We thank God for something that we didn't see happen, but we had the certainty that he did. Amen. And we also thank God for something that haven't, haven't happened, but we hope and know is going to happen. So we just exercise faith. That is what faith is, as you can see there. Another thing that I want to share with you today about faith is who do we put our faith on? Sure. We look at Jesus. We've been singing to him. We've been talking about him already. He is the foundation of our faith. He is where everything comes from. Knowing, having the certainty that he died on that cross for you and for me that he resurrected on the third day, that he right now is sitting in heaven next to God on the throne, interceding for us, and that he is the soon returning king. It is what we live for. It is what we hope for, and it is what we have to stand on. Anything else don't belong. It is about Jesus. It is Jesus. It is because of Jesus that we can all sit here today. So we need to understand that. Because it's, it's easy to get caught in the doctrines, in the rules, in the revelations, right? But let's not forget, this is what we stand for. He is the foundation. And you see in that story that we already read, Peter was a man that was clear of that. In a time when Jesus asked Peter, Peter, who do you say that I am? He responded, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So I'm not surprised that God used Peter to do such a miracle, to resurrect Tabitha. Amen. 
Now, hmm, this is something about faith that I also want to share with you this morning. And it's that these two passages and the contrast of it. One time when Peter was with Jesus and he was on the boat walking towards Jesus, he started to doubt as he was walking. And, and he called on Jesus and Jesus came to him and it was awesome. But Jesus said this to him, you of little faith. Then another time, then, Jesus talking to the disciples says, if you have the faith, the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So looking at these two passages, I started meditating and working with the Holy Spirit. And God is understanding that faith is not so much about size, but it is about that word right there, little. That in the Greek means belittle. It means minimizing. How do we minimize our faith? And how we can increase our faith? It's right there. James 2.26. It says, without works, our faith is dead. And that word, works, means application. It means to walk on. It means to take actions. So our faith, if we don't take action, like Pastor Ray was just saying, we'll stay dead. If we don't apply what we learn from the Bible, what we learn as the people of God, it's going to decrease. It's kind of like this picture. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Whatever you're facing, if you're not taking steps of faith, faith's not going to look like this to that problem. It's not going to look bigger. We've been talking about steps of faith through this series. Edgar spoke to us about being in relationship with the Father. Pastor Brett spoke to us about that liminal space of needing community. Pastor Sean last week spoke to us about how the Bible is our reality and not the world. So those are action, steps, applications that we need to do in order to maintain our faith like this. Amen? If we do the opposite, this is what faith is going to look like. If we don't work in a relationship with God, if we don't work in community, if we allow the world to dictate our reality instead of the Bible, we are going to minimize our faith. You see, there's a proportion because all of the things that I told you about, they focus you on Jesus. But when we don't focus on Jesus, faith gets minimized. It's not that we don't doubt, because that's another thing that I want to clarify that the Lord has taught me. It's like, Maria, it's not that you're not going to doubt. We have doubts. And it, it is okay. I mean, the Bible said that Abraham, when he was given the promise, he considered his age. And he considered Sarah's age. But instead, what did he choose to do? He chose to praise God. So we had to make sure that even though we are doubting about that promise, we are doubting about that job that God said, that we don't give birth to that doubt. And how we give birth to that doubt is by our actions. You know, you start preaching to yourself. You start talking to yourself. It's like, I'm not going to give this step out of fear. I'm not going to give this step out of doubt. I am going to do a step based on faith. This is what God says. This is what I'm going to do. And that's how you defeat and you keep your faith increasing. That is how. Now, let's make sure to understand that these steps, we're not allowed to do it without the Holy Spirit. He is the one that provides that power for us to do those steps because he said it back in James also. Without the Spirit, we are also dead. So we have to work with that relationship with the Holy Spirit. their weakness in us. There are things that at a given moment will decrease our faith when we're in front of that that we're facing. 
I saw it in this passage. When I read this passage, I was so amazed that God used Peter to do this miracle that I was like, Lord, I need to see what Peter is doing. I need to learn what he learned from Jesus so I can apply it as well. And the Lord revealed two things about it. He said, you know what? One thing that Peter recognized was I have weakness. I have weakness. So we can read in this verse what he did when he arrived. It says like the, all the widows was like showing him. You know, Tabitha was dead. She was a good woman. So they're surrounding him, telling him all about her. Peter understood there's a weakness about me. And it is when I get my feelings involved with faith. Like Pastor Sean said last week, feelings do not dictate faith. You cannot go by your feeling if you want to walk in faith and maintain that faith in a rising level. So he put a barrier of protection around his faith at that very moment. And what did he do? He put them all outside before he started to pray. Let me show you how to find out about that weakness. When we was with Jesus on the boat, there was a moment. No, sorry, not on the boat. I'm so sorry. It's um, when he was, um, Jesus was about to, be, to get arrested. He started saying to Jesus, you cannot let them do this to you. You know, his feelings got on the way. And what did Jesus did? He rebuked him. He said, get away from me, Satan, because you are focusing on your feelings and the things of men and not the things of God. So that's how Peter knew that he had that weakness. And he started putting protection at that moment. Amen. Another thing that he did was this. And that was the detonator for the message that God gave me. When he prayed, he didn't pray facing the body. Because right there he's telling me, turning to the body. So he wasn't facing the body. So that was another weakness that he recognized about his, himself. What I focus on, what I face, what am I focusing on, will decrease or increase my faith as I walk with Jesus, as I pray, as I do this following. How did he knew that? Because when he was on the boat and Jesus called on him, there was a moment that he says, but he saw the wind. And that's when he started sinking. So he recognized that and he put that barrier when he was about to pray for Tabitha. And we know the result of that. We know how God used him to do this amazing miracle. Today, that is the message that we want to bring to you, is we need to start recognizing our weakness. What's surrounding us can decrease our faith instead of increasing it. We discover as a family, you know, that one of our weakness is we don't do well with mistakes because we like to do and to give our 100%. But we now have put boundaries, barriers of protection about not feeling enough. And this is where my spiritual leader at home and in life is going to be sharing his point of view. What barriers, what protection does he use to protect his faith? Blanley will be sharing as well. And I will say she will be speaking for herself, but also her generation the things that they have to go through. So let's hear from them. Amen. Amen. So um, when Maria asked me if I would share it today, um, she asked me this question. She says, as a man, how do you protect your faith? Well, for me, the way I protect my faith is by not letting my mistakes and my failures distinct me from God. And, um, and Peter, Maria spoke about Peter today. Peter is actually one of my favorite characters in the Bible because he felt many times, right? And, um, and I, I'm about to share with you some scripture that has helped me overcome that. 
So here we see when Peter denies Jesus three times. Right? In my eyes, that's a big mistake. That's a big failure, right? If we were to know the Bible, we would have said, there's no way this guy is going to be forgiven. There's no way that he's coming from that. But we know the story, right? So that's a big failure. And then we're going to see how Peter felt after that. He says that he wept bitterly. And this was me. When I, was, when I made a mistake, I felt bitter. I felt guilty. And then I, 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 I felt that God was disappointed with me. But listen to this. I was disappointed at me, not God. Until I recognized that it was a hard, hard life for me. So when this happened to me, my first action was run away from God. I pray less. I worship less. And the Bible was nowhere around. So let's see what helped me is how Peter reacted to this. After he felt this, what did Peter do? This is amazing. When I read this and the Holy Spirit ministered to my life, this helped me. It says here in John 20, verse 6, that when the disciple heard that Jesus was alive, Jesus, Peter was one of the two that ran into the tomb. And the Bible says that without hesitation, he went in. That is not a man that is running away from God. Are you kidding me? You deny Jesus and you get trying to get closer to him? I'm like, no. I will run the other way. And then here on John 21, 7, he says that the Bible says that when Jesus resurrected, he was walking alongside the beach. And the disciples were fishing at a distance. And they recognized Jesus. And John said, I think it's Jesus. Peter couldn't wait for the boat to cross over. He jumped into the water. I'm like, no, what is this? Doesn't make sense. But that's when the Spirit started coming to me and saying, hey, when you make mistake, when you fail, that's when you pray more. That's when you read the Bible more. And that's when you worship more. So this, 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 this is amazing. If, you, if you're going to take something out of this message today, mm. that and everything that she said. <laughs> She, she said we, say we're praying as a family, so that's what we're doing. And what is so more, most ama more amazing about this is that this is what happens when you are persistent. This is what happens when you are persistent. Jesus restored Peter. And do not only restore him. Look at, listen to this. Take care of my sheep. He trusts him with something bigger and greater. So if you're here today... I fail, I'm going to be honest, I have failed as a husband, but Christ restored me. And he made my marriage even stronger. I have failed as a father, but Christ has restored me. And he made my relationship with my daughter even stronger. Amen. That's the guy that I serve. Amen. Amen. That's the guy that I serve. And that's the God you serve. So, my prayer to God, to Jesus is that today, if you have made a mistake, if you feel that you have failed God, you want to step away from this. And he's going to give you something greater. So that's always not pushing me to make mistakes, but it's always pushing me to run to him. And you, made, you already did your first step by being here today. Amen. Amen. I don't know how I'm going to follow that because that was pretty good. <laughs> we didn't rehearse that like, yesterday. What happened? Anyway. Um, hi, everyone. Hola. Grandma. Oh, oh, wow. Thank you for saying hola. Um, hello, people online. It's good to see you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my perspective and how I feel like things get in the way of faith. And just not 
not just for me, but just for my entire generation. And I feel like self-doubt and fear and just like self-loathing in general is a big obstacle in people's faith most of the time, especially in this society, because we grow up with social media and though it can be great sometimes, I don't wanna look at a vlog where someone wakes up at 5.30 in the morning, works out for two hours, reads the Bible for three hours, makes a smoothie, does their work, and <laughs> they're basically done by their day at by 2.30. And I just, well, I, I woke up and I ate Cheetos. Like that's very depressing. <laughs> And that makes me feel, and you know, growing up in the church, I see like these strong leaders of people of faith who actually seek God and who love worshiping and dancing and can spend hours reading the Bible. When for me, when I first started reading the Bible, I was like, golly, I don't even know what this mess is saying. So like, I had a lot of doubts in myself. I was like, I'm not doing this right. I'm not worshiping. Whenever I prayed, I would think about my math homework or I would think about how everything, like everything I needed to do in the day. I just, literally, I got in my own way of my time with God, because I'm like, I'm not spending enough time with him. This is small, this is puny, this like, I mean, come on, God, like my grandma, she can just read the Bible for five hours and I'm struggling with five minutes, so. But this great verse that actually Pastor Sean gave to me um, a little bit ago, um, kind of helped me with that feeling of self-doubt and kind of minimizing everything I was doing. and. It's the story with the five loaves and the two fish. If you guys, if you need a refresher. Um, there were 5,000 people and the disciples, they only had um, five loaves and two fish to give, which can barely feed them. So they were like looking at God like, what are we gonna, like, what do you think is gonna happen? They were looking at Jesus like, I don't, it's not gonna work. And he was like, give me this stuff. He prayed over it. He blessed it and he multiplied it to feed the 5,000. And I see my five minutes with God, I see my 15 minutes, my prayer, my broken time with God as the five loaves and two fish. My mom said before that faith is in things not seen and things hoped for. I did not see what God was doing with my five minutes a day of prayer. I hoped that he would do something, otherwise it was just for nothing, you know? But what he really was doing was taking those five minutes, he was blessing it, and he was multiplying it to feed the 5,000. Yeah. So, yeah, isn't that awesome how he does that? I didn't see it. I didn't really feel it in that moment. I felt like I was doing everything wrong. I wasn't praying the right way. I wasn't saying the right things. But as like, if, if you keep going, if you keep pushing through, you're gonna feel that, it, feel it multiplying. And 15 minutes is gonna turn to 30 minutes. And 30 minutes is gonna turn to you like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's gonna turn to you not no longer being, you know, dreading, <laughs> dreading going to the Bible. You're eventually going to enjoy it someday. Um, and so a practical way that I overcome self-doubt in my faith um, is through the next verse. Thank you, Dad. Taking every thought captive. So, yeah, isn't that a good verse? I hear it a lot. Um, taking every thought captive. So before I go into my time with God, I have to take myself out of that. I need a minute to just grieve myself and just like whine to God a little bit. And like my head gets filled with a lot of negative thoughts and lies. And even though I know they're lies, in that moment, they don't feel like lies. They feel like truths that are holding my life captive. So what I do before I do any of my worship time, my prayer, is I sit down on my phone. I know people say to journal, but if I'm being real serious, I type faster than I like write. And I just need to get my thoughts out. You know, like I can literally close my eyes and text my friend in class. It's amazing. So Isley knows about that. Um, so basically... I write down everything negative thought in my mind and I just lay it out. So like on the next slide, you'll kind of see it. Hopefully, maybe, yeah, okay. So like I just write in my notes app, I'm not doing enough. I'm a bad Christian for not reading my Bible today. No one loves me. I just write them all out and I just feel, you know, I grieve. I don't suppress it. I like let God know, like, listen, I'm really struggling right now. And then afterwards, I have to force myself, like, okay, I'm gonna read every single thing I wrote, and I'm going to respond as if I'm God talking to me. Even if I feel like it's too sappy, even if I feel like it's not true, I'm going to force myself to respond the way God will respond to me. So for example, I'm not doing enough. You're going to school. You're eating a meal and a half a day. <laughs> You're trying on your homework. That's all you need to do today. Like, you don't have to save the world today. You're good. Yeah. You're all right. Yeah. I'm a bad Christian for not reading my Bible. You can get back on track tomorrow. Today is not Oosh. it forever. You can continue. 
Also, God isn't mad at you. He just wants to talk to you. He just wants to spend time with you. And then, no one loves me. I know people say it's kind of sappy to apply to things with Bible verses, you know, but for me, it is the best way to combat lies because it's concrete and never changing. And God breathes. So there you go. So for no one loves me, I always put like Romans 8, 39, which if you know me, that's my favorite verse. For I'm convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God through our Savior, Christ Jesus. So, amen. 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 So if you struggle with, you know, getting in your own way, feel like, you know, you're trying to worship, all you can think about is all the terrible things you did that day, all the terrible things about yourself, I suggest that you take a minute and just do this before you get into worship because that will build your faith and allow God to come in into your life. Sometimes I think I have to be perfect for God to use me, but that's actually the most insulting, insulting thing I can say because God can use me when I'm broken. He can use me when like I only got five minutes for prayer. He can use me and in any stage, in any moment of my life, because we're talking about the God who opens seas, shakes mountains, ra like raises people from the dead. Like Hallelujah. literally the galaxies and the fish and the, like all them jokers, they love him. Like they worship him. That's the God we're talking about. And I'm saying he can't use me, you know? So I just have to remember that in that moment. And um, yeah, don't let yourself get in the way of growing your faith and continue to push on with that time with God, even if it's difficult. So thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. What can I say after that? What can I say after that? And I just, I just want you to take a moment. We are going to pray worship. Come to the Lord. Come to the altar. Keep that step of faith because this is what the Lord does when you go after him. When you put him first in everything that you do. When you say like that verse that we read at the beginning, my house is going to be built on the rock that is Jesus Christ. Come, lay it out to him as we worship. Ask him, God, what are my weaknesses? Teach me how to put those boundaries. Because if he used Peter, he can certainly use all of us. Thank you so much for receiving this message from us. Thank you.